once you reconnect with your authentic self, a lot of medical conditions can abate and even remit completely. I'm not There's a deep need to belong, a deep need to be loyal, and a sense of betrayal. When that loyalty is somehow uh, insulted, Paul, if you didn't feel, get the love that you needed, you'll be consumed by being liked, and then you'll be very likable and very nice. And you might become a helpful, very helping individual, which is a coping pattern. Now, you can be genuinely nice and genuinely supportive of others and still look after your own needs. That's human nature, I think. But a lot of people are very nice and likable and helpful by suppressing their own needs. That's a coping mechanism. Everybody says how nice they are. And when they die at age 50 of cancer, everybody shows up at their funeral and then they weep about how nice they were, how selfless they were. The, the, the child basically has two needs. You have the need for attachment which is the seeking of closeness and proximity with another human being. And fundamentally, the, the, the attachment dynamic is the most powerful dynamic in human life. And its basic purpose is the protection and nurturing of the young. So that infants attached to their parents and parents attached to infants for the purpose of, on the one hand, of being taken care of and on the other, of taking care of. So that's attachment. And we're wired for attachment all our lives. It's the most important dynamic we have, and as General Petraeus could tell you, you know, that we're wired for attachment, and sometimes when our attachment needs get sent in certain directions, it'll trump everything else. That's one need that we have is for attachment. Without attachment, there's no human life. It's just impossible. And without mating, without communities, we would not have survived as, as a species either. And as rugged individualists, we would not have got off the first evolutionary base, you know, let alone, you know, come to where we are right now. So it's, you know, the whole idea of human beings is competitive and aggressive, is total nonsense. But the other need that we have is for authenticity, to be ourselves. And, and uh, that again has to do with survival. If you're not in touch with yourself out in the wild, you don't survive. So authenticity is being in touch with yourself and being able, to, being able to act on your awareness uh, of self in relationship to the environment. I mean, that's just authenticity. So if I feel something, I pay attention to that. If I don't, I'm in danger. So we have this need for authenticity. But if a child is confronted with a dilemma, that if I'm authentic, express my feelings, then my attachments are threatened because my parents can't handle it because they're too stressed, depressed, or traumatized themselves, then perforce the child will not automatically, I should say, will automatically but not consciously suppress their authenticity. And so that the suppression of gut feelings and authenticity is a coping mechanism. That means I'm no longer in touch with my needs. I no longer pay touch attention to my feelings, my emotions. I will no longer be aware of them, I won't express them, I won't know what I need. Which is all kinds of implications, but one of them is, is that I'll be compulsively then, I may then compulsively uh, serve the needs of others, ignoring my own, hence disease. Uh, or, I may then develop all kinds of false needs, which then really are what addictions are all about. So that it's that irresolvable tension between authenticity and attachment that many children in our society are, 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 are faced with that results in their self-suppression. And that's and one of the outcomes, not, all, not the only possible outcome, but one possible outcome is then that niceness is a coping mechanism. Almost anybody, when they're being authentic, has a sense of them being authentic. How do we know that we're being authentic? Like, years before I had any of these concepts formally worked out in my mind or had read much about it. But I already knew when I was betraying myself and being, being less than myself and being other than myself. How did I know that? There's some inner knowledge for many of us, simply because the authentic self, not that it disappears, and then when we're not in touch with it, there's a kind of a shame, there's a kind of a suffering that happens. So, 
that shame and that internal suffering, that, 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 that sense of self-betrayal is our sure guide that we're not being ourselves. On one level, that happens to a lot of people. And then we may look good in the eyes of others and yet internally we suffer shame because we know that we, we're not being ourselves. When we say, how do we know? Well, that, that for many of us, there's an internal knowledge that arises. Now, how, why? Why? Because that essential self hasn't gone away and is calling to us. And we don't feel right when we betray it or when we're not out of tongue, contact with it. Now, that doesn't happen for many people. That doesn't happen for everybody. For some people, then, it takes some catastrophe. So what I'm saying is that at some point or another, if you're not in touch with that inner voice, if you don't hear it, the body will speak to you loud and clear. You're going to get something happen to you. Uh, and sometimes that'll happen in the form of illness or symptoms. Then the body's talking to you. The body's saying no when you're not saying no. If, if the voice doesn't speak to you directly, or if, if it speaks to you and you don't listen, your body at some point is going to kick in. Or you're going to get depressed. Or anxious. Or something else. Or something will happen in your personal relationships. And at that point, you can say, well, it's, I'm not with the right partner. Screw them, it's all their fault, which many of us say. Or, for some people, it becomes the, the opening of a door where we begin to look, okay, what in here wasn't authentic? What in here wasn't uh, genuine? How, how did I create this situation? How do I keep creating these situations over and over again? Am I just a victim of bad luck? Or is there some pattern here? In other words, something happens, some difficulty happens to, um, to shake you out of your, your complacent belief that things are just fine the way they are. And, and as the California-based uh, great, great teacher, A.H. Alma, says that the, the most difficult thing that ha things that happen to us are also the most compassionate things because basically they're ways of a part of it how he puts it a part of us a part of us that loves us more than anything else puts these roadblocks in our way saying that's not the way that's not the way that's not the way you better not go that you know so he there's roadblocks in the way to bring us to ourselves you know and so we can look upon our difficulties as problems to get rid of or we can look at them as teachings to bring us back to ourselves. That once you reconnect with your authentic self, a lot of medical conditions can abate and even remit completely. I'm not promising that. I'm just saying I've seen it too often. And, and, and there's too many examples also written up in the literature. So that, yeah, healing is always possible. But out of, a seven, out of 100 women with breast cancer, only 7 carry the gene, 93 do not. Out of 100 women with the gene, not all of them will get the disease. No, they are much higher risk, no question about it. It just means that, for the most part, genes don't determine illnesses. What then does? And, and, and by the way, this is true for whether we're talking about most physical illnesses and mental illnesses. So to talk about genetics is kind of a lazy person's way of trying to explain something. Because scientifically, there's very little basis to it. So for example, all these genetically determined medical mental health conditions, they say about ADHD, which is something I've written about after my own diagnosis in my 50s, that it's the most heritable mental illness there is. Well, as I say in this book, to say that <laughs> ADHD is the most heritable mental illness. It's like saying that quartz is the most chewable crystal. Because it's not true. It's neither a disease nor is it genetic. Nobody has ever found a single gene that determines any mental health condition. Nobody's ever found a group of genes that determine any mental health condition. Nobody has ever f found a group of genes that if you don't have them, you will not have a certain mental health conditions. There are a large group of genes that the more of them you have, the more you risk and more at risk you are for any number of mental health conditions, but no specific ones. 
which means that the genes cannot cause the disease. Because if they did, when they showed up, so should the disease in every case. But it doesn't. And you can have the same disease, or if you want to call it that, but even without the genes. Because the fact is, scientifically speaking, that genes are turned on and off by the environment. So it's a question of what kind of environment is asking, acting on certain genes that will promote one kind of uh, development or a less healthy kind of development. And so that loss of authenticity, for reasons I will not go into explaining now, but maybe you'll intuit to a significant degree, and you'll certainly get that information in this book and my other books, is that loss of authenticity is a significant cause of illness and, and distress, physical and mental. Is that loss of authenticity is a significant cause of illness and, and distress, physical and mental. <clears throat> and there's a, I love quoting Hungarian doctors for some reason, I don't know why. And uh, Dr. Janos Johans Selye, S E L Y E, who was the preeminent researcher of stress, in fact, he coined the word stress in a way that we use it today. And he's the one that showed in the laboratory how stressing animals will have physiological impacts on their immune system, on their hormonal apparatus, on their intestines. And Selye was not only a, a brilliant physician, he was also a, a brilliant researcher. He was also a humanist. And he wrote in his book on stress, he said that most of our tensions and frustrations come from compulsive needs to act the role of someone that we're not. So inauthenticity is our biggest source of stress, he pointed out. But that inauthenticity, he may not have realized, wasn't our fault, it wasn't a kind of a mistake, it wasn't um, a moral failure, it was an adaptive response to our early environment. So the question then becomes not to judge ourselves for being unauthentic, not to judge ourselves from being disconnected from ourselves, but to understand that actually those are normal responses to an abnormal environment. But if you want to become healthy, guess what? The word health originates in a word for wholeness. So if trauma is the disconnection from ourselves, then, then health is the reconnection, which is entirely possible, entirely available for us, because that capacity for healing is simply in our nature as organisms. So, and there's a part of us that can never be destroyed. It can be obscured. We can lose connection with it. I certainly have for long periods of my life. But it's always there, as long as there's consciousness. This capacity for healing, for rejoining our disconnected parts and to become whole and to heal, that's just with us all our lives. And so that I don't have a negative message for you. The message I have is that healing, trauma daunting and damaging as it can be, both on a social and certainly an individual level, it can also be healed. Because trauma is not what happened to you, but what happened inside you as a result. And if you're still carrying the imprints and residues of what happened to you, that can be healed. If I got the message that I wasn't worthy and important just for existing, that I had to prove my worth to the world, and that created certain behaviors and on my part, I can actually come to the conclusion it was never true. It was never true that I wasn't worth it. It was never true that you were not worth it. It was never true. It was simply a conclusion you came to as a result of what happened to you. And if you stop trying to prove to the world by being a hard worker or being extraordinarily pleasant or being focusing on your looks all the time or focusing on your successes and achievements, but just dare to show up as the vulnerable creature that we all are, and reconnected with your true vulnerable self, which at the time, adaptively, was too painful for you to experience, but you're no longer that helpless child. Well, then that just means that healing is possible to you. And so